Sports Bros Podcast. It is Sunday night, Oct- uh, I'm sorry, November 8th, 2015. My name is Andy Karchner, a.k.a. Big Bro, coming at you from the Pacific Northwest. Hey guys, Aaron Karchner, I am little bro of this Sports Bros tandem. I'm still in San Antonio, Texas. Again, we're, we're just epitomizing BYU Nation. It's always all over the country. BYU Nation truly spreads far and wide. Um, we're trying to get back into the rhythm here on Sunday night, doing kind of the first thing. Talking BYU football, basketball starting up, um, heading into the fall and winter seasons. It's a really exciting time to be a BYU fan of anything right now. Basketball season has, I mean, it's preseason, so it hasn't officially started. But, man, this is really getting into the best time of the year. I love it. No doubt. I mean, the World Series just ended. You got NBA. You got college basketball. You got NFL. You got um, college football. It, it truly is the best time of year to be a sports fan. Somebody else said NHL and NASCAR, but who, who really watches those anyways? Uh, and is NASCAR a sport? I mean, do we need to get okay, into that well, right now? Well, we would need to have a whole <laughs> separate segment for if NASCAR is a sport. And I live in the South, so I don't really want to say my true opinions on that other than the fact that I have an opinion other than what the general South believes. Yeah, no. I have a friend who told me, "Have you seen how much those drivers sweat in there? It is a sport." I'm like, "They're know, not sweating kind of, how, because how they're doing Tony anything Stewart, athletic, buddy." How, how is Tony Stewart overweight when he sits there for four hours at a time and sweats off ten pounds? You right? could say the same thing about Bartolo Colon, so or Shaquille O'Neal for, for that, that matter, matter. <laughs> or even Babe Ruth, or half the, the offensive boat. linemen on any given football team. Yeah, so that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, before we get too deep into sports, I have a major, major life announcement to make right here on the Sports Bros podcast. Drum roll, please. I bought Star Wars tickets. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me you were pregnant again. And I was like, holy crap, you're only have a four month old. Oh, gosh, no. This is good news. Oh, no. Don't tell my wife I said that. <laughs> No, so I live in a small town in Southern Oregon, and, uh, you know, everyone who knows me knows I'm a really big Star Wars fan, and so we have this podunk little theater here in town that did not put tickets on sale on the same day that the general public did. You know the Fandango and a lot of the other, and Regal, and I think, you know, most of the theaters and and ticketing websites put tickets on sale on the night, the Monday night um, game right after the trailer. Uh, was released on the Monday Night Football game. And then um, tickets went on sale and like Fandango servers crashed and, you know, yeah. the, the, you know the nerds just completely overtook the internet. Um, but my my theater didn't put them on sale for a couple weeks afterwards because they're like, oh, you know yeah. what they were doing? It was supply and demand. They were driving the prices up just a little bit more <laughs> no. by making all of you guys just wait that much longer. If only that were true. I mean, they're actually cheaper than your most than most theaters. I think they're just like, oh yeah, I guess we should probably put Star Wars tickets on sale. It's only the biggest movie, you know, event in decades. Whatever. I, so I, this is kind of a year. the the movie The movie guys have really been coming out with some big movies. Lost World, rejuvenating the direct, yeah. Jurassic World. You know that series, and then Star Wars. I'm mean, talking about two huge franchises coming back into the fold. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, and of course, Avengers had their second movie this year as right, well. Right, yeah, so. another one. Huge, huge franchise. Anyways, that's completely off topic. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, I just wanted everyone to know that I have secured my Star Wars tickets, and I'm actually going to be watching it the night before. You know, the, the, not only is it not a midnight showing, it's December 17th at 8 o'clock. So I'm going to be ahead of the crowd. Although Now that, now that uh, Sports Bros Fan Nation can uh, yeah. be the sigh of relief for you. We can that's right. That's right. Um, so a lot going on, though. I mean, switching gears over to BYU sports. I mean, just so many things to talk about right now. Basketball is in full swing. Crazy game on Friday. Um, but really, I think we have to headline tonight's conversation with this University of Missouri just craziness that's going on right now. I mean, it's unprecedented in my memory in college football. For those of you who have been living under a rock, uh, University of Missouri, 30 black University of Missouri football students um, have decided to go on strike and not participate in any football activities um, as a show of solidarity with a greater student movement to try to get the president of the university fired because they feel like he has not been responsive enough to some major racial tensions and Tensions, I don't think, is even a big enough word. Some major racial incidents that have happened um, 
on campus since I think it really started heating up during the Ferguson event, which is only a couple hours away. And then other events have led up. They feel like the president hasn't been responsive. One guy is now on a hunger strike has been since, uh, I think he's on day five right now. Yeah, I think it was Monday or Tuesday that he started his hunger strike. Football team, at least the black students on the football team, have joined and you know not joined the hunger strike, but have now said we're not going to do anything football until the president is fired or resigns. And of course, this, you know, what happens on Saturday? I mean, everyone. Yeah, knows. yeah it's 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 kind of hard to talk about it, especially from you know our age. You know, we're late twenties, early thirties, and we never really dealt with the race issue to this kind of a scale. Um, in, in our lifetime, especially from a, 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 a effect on college athletics, it's kind of interesting how these movements always tend to have a forefront at the university level. Um, whether it's yeah. the student body, just for some reason, is a little more on the activist front or whatever. But regardless of that, it, it's really it's sad. You know, I've done a lot of reading and watched some videos and, and stuff on the situation, and it, it, it does seem from my limited. Um, knowledge and gleaning of information, it, it does seem kind of, for lack of a word, pathetic how how real of an issue it is there. Um, I, I'm, I'm in no way undermining that it's an issue. It's an issue, and it's very outlined um, with specific incidents, and it's really, really sad that we still have issues uh, of race, um, segregation, or anything like that anywhere in this country. And then, again, with the limited information that I have and a lot of hearsay, it doesn't seem like Tim Wolf has been very responsive or not even so much responsive, but even acknowledging um, mm. uh, an incident or, or, or anything like that. It's really, really, really sad. And so we, you know, we as sports pros and, and just as human beings in general, just like our heart goes out to those people that are victims of these racial incidents that are just, there's just no place for that in society. And it's really unfortunate that it's happening. And it's then it's unfortunate that it's leading into so many other dominoes that are following up, falling down in place of it. And it just so happens to be a football game that BYU is involved in potentially this week. You know, it's, it's just these leaders of these universities and, and politicians, I mean, and so many different people who are responsible to try to, you know, respond to these types of things they just seem like idiots. Like they just don't realize that all it takes is a little bit of validation. Like, yes, we understand this is an issue, some conversations, and then, you know, things can diffuse fairly quickly. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to be happy with what you sure. do or anything. But I mean, when you just kind of put things on the back burner for so long to the point where, you know, this student group had to go out into some parade or something and like stand in front of the president's, you know, uh, convertible and and just kind of make these big deals about things and it's things that need to be made a big deal out of i'm not trying to minimize it but just these these leaders just seem like idiots they think that they just don't need to respond to these types of issues and i just can't imagine someone in missouri home of ferguson it just you ought to just make these types of things priority number one at least validating and having conversations about it but yeah. i mean i don't know all the details about it i just think it's a, a, an unfortunate situation all around but now it's just kind of it's it's kind of interesting how BYU is getting stuck in the crossfire here because <laughs> there's been plenty of boycotts and strikes dealing with the LDS church and and things like that and this is one that they're in the crossfire but not because of something they did yeah, or didn't do it's pretty circumstantial but kind of like unfortunate because there's all these people being like what did BYU do you know what right it's, it's really not. I mean, right. it's just a Twitter poll that you put out there today. What was your Twitter poll? Yeah, so actually, it was right before the show started, and so we'll, we'll keep this open, you know, obviously through through the show. Should, should BYU let Missouri out of the contract? Let me give you some background here. So, you know, it came out that in the contract, there's a buyout clause that if if either team is not able to make it to the game, which is weird. You wouldn't even think about that, but you know, lawyers are awesome and put all these things in yeah. and for these kind of circumstances. <laughs> right. I mean, who knows when there's going to be a major racial racial unrest and you can't play football because of it. So they put in the contract that um, if any, if either team is not able to, you know, participate for whatever reason, then they pay the other team a million bucks. Um, it's just pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not like, a whole lot of money in the grand scheme of college football but i mean that's about the amount of money that you know you pay you know byu paid wagner i think eight hundred fifty thousand to come play so those those numbers are, are fairly normal um but there's been some talk 
by people, I don't know if it's mostly Ute fans just trying to, you know, like stir the nest, but there's been some talk that BYU should take this opportunity and if the game needs to be canceled, not make Missouri pay the million dollars, right? Like BYU can like show their solidarity with the students. I don't know. Like people think that maybe BYU shouldn't make Missouri pay for it. I that it, it's a really it's it's really a lose lose no matter who does what here because let's be honest here if BYU says no we want to go we want to go forward and play this game then there's going to be those people that say oh BYU's not acknowledging the real situation that's going on here if BYU says no we don't want it then you're going to have the fan base that's going to be upset well why are we just caving I mean or or anything like that it's honestly I, I think BYU should say at least say. We're going to play the game if Missouri puts up a team. We're going to be available. We will be in Kansas City yeah. on Saturday. I I think, you know, what would be a nice gesture? If it, whether whether um, the Missouri football players, um, you know, the, the black players play or it's just all the whites or whatever, I don't know how they do it. If BYU gave some kind of gesture, whether it be like a black wristband or something like that. Or BYU is famous for like riding yeah, Scorpion like in the that. arm, I something, right? Would, I think that would actually reverberate a little more. I think, I think in this kind of turmoil, I think a lot of people need sports. I think people turn to sports. It's an outlet for a lot of people's psyche to just be like, you know what? For three hours today, I'm going to go watch some football, let the outside world kind of stay in the outside world and go cheer on my Cougars or cheer on my Tigers. And then if B- and then if you see BYU come out with some kind of emblem in support of this strike that's going on in Missouri, I think that reverberates in the whole college football world more than BYU saying, you know what, I, I think we're just going to take a step back here and let you guys handle it. I don't know. I'm, it's a hard situation because I don't really think BYU in this circumstance can really win no matter what they do. They just have to sit here and play by ear. I actually, I don't. I think the whole people that think the BYU should not make Missouri pay the money, I think that's backwards. I mean, to me, if BYU wants to kind of be on the right side of this issue, which I think most people will agree is the student side and not the administration sure. side, you want to make them pay the money. The money doesn't affect the students. The money affects the administration. Who's going, oh, my gosh, not only do I have this kid who's starving himself and the possibility of this really bad PR if this game doesn't go, but I'm also going to have to pay a million bucks if I don't do something about well, and this. And not only do they have play. to pay, but then they lose out on the revenue of a game. Mm-hmm. So really, if BYU exactly. accepts, and that's why you put these buyout clauses in there, if BYU accepts that buyout and says, okay, you're canceling, it really is just even more negative press towards Missouri than it is yeah. anything to BYU. BYU is just living by the the code of the contract, and they're just saying, okay, yeah. you, your guys' issue. Yeah, I, I I think I think letting Missouri out of the contract actually would end up biting BYU in the butt. It would make people say, well, look, BYU's trying to you know give the administration an out here. They're trying to kind of be buddy buddy with these people. I, I, I so I think you you play you say we're going to play the game if Missouri's ready, and if they're not, then they're going to pay us the money. I mean, that's, that's just how we're going to go, and if Missouri has to take its own lumps, like the administration has to eat the consequences of them not being responsive to their students, and part of that consequences is this contract that we signed, and then BYU's on the right side of everything. They get the money, and they get to kind of be on the right side of the controversy. That's how I yeah. view it. Yeah, it, it's unfortunate. From, from Again, the, the racial issues aside, it's really unfortunate because this was a game that a lot of BYU fans were excited about, even mm. though Missouri's on a down year. It's one more win um, towards double digit. But again, I, I feel like it's almost like wrong that we're talking about the football side of things here because there's so much more really at stake at the University of Missouri right now than then football. Why you getting to seven and two or six and you know or eight I mean two. eight and two or seven and three. You know, I mean that that seems so menial compared to what's truly going on. Yeah. But it's something you gotta talk about because that's something that University of Missouri, you know, board of directors and presidents is up they're talking about it because it has a hu- a potential huge fallout from a national PR side of things what they do in these next five days. Yeah. On, t- turning to Twitter uh, in response uh, at though the underscore wise guys, I listened to these guys podcasts the other day. These guys are really f- funny guys. Uh, they, they responded um, to my, to our question should be why you let Missouri out of the contract. They said, if accusations are over the line, they should play. If they're legitimate, they should let the school take a hit. No, don't do it. 
Uh, okay, I, the I think, accusations, so they're saying if the accusations of the University of Missouri student body, if they're over the line, I, I guess I don't understand what they're saying because I think from everything that I've read, all of the accusations against Tim Wolf and the, and the university as a whole, the incidents and the lack of validation or anything like that, I don't, I don't think there's anything there that's being questioned as far well, as it's not it, – it's really an issue. I, I, I guess I don't understand what they're saying. I, I think they're just saying that, um, you know, if you really dig into the facts and um, it seems like they're, you know, it's really serious issues that the administration has, then, um, then the, like I was saying, then the administration t- should take their lumps and have to pay up. So I think that's all they're really saying. And I mean, I think most people just generally agree that, yeah, the administration is doing really bad things. But I mean, to be completely honest, and I don't want to get too controversial into these, it, you know, iffy topics here on the podcast where we talk about sports, but really there's another side of the story that ha- that uh, that administrators have to worry about and that's free speech issues um I, I, it, it would be one thing if um if you know black students were getting beat up or were being you know denied admissions or you know being treated differently or, or something like that but when you're talking about other students making derogatory derogatory comments toward other students there's free speech issues at issue here we remember uh this year i think it was this year also university of oklahoma students got reprimanded for singing some racist songs on the bus and even some of the most adamant you know race advocates had to admit well there's first amendment issues here so without getting deep into it that that could be a whole whole episode in and of itself it's it's no matter which way you slice it it's a really sensitive issue, really, from everybody's perspective. Administration, student body, PR, college athletics, state, the state of Missouri, this being their flagship university. I mean, it, it's really nobody has an easy job here in the next four or five days. From a, strictly from this game happening, you talk about all the ramifications everywhere else. It's, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge deal. And I, I just think it just is just crazy how – Again, college football is so big that the the tug and pull of what will happen this Saturday, play or not play, will have an enormous impact on this entire situation moving forward. All right. Well, we got, um, you know, thanks for everyone uh, chiming in on Twitter. The wise guys at the underscore wise guys. Uh, obviously listening right now live um, say I, they say, I meant that maybe the admin is being overly accused of negligence or wrongdoing. Not that these things aren't happening on campus. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that's kind yeah, of, that's, we, that's we what they have to sort out. They have to sort out the facts and he's absolutely right. I mean, all right now that we're going on and really any media outlet is going on is hearsay and, or those actual, so he, he's right. It, it's, yeah. it depends. I, I, I personally, very personally, no bias in here whatsoever think yeah. it would be, more of a hit from a PR perspective and everything that can unfold if they do not play this game. Yeah, it's going to be played. I mean, I think, do you agree? I, it's going to be played. I think they're going to play the game. I, I, I think Missouri will. Play I, I seriously I really do. don't know, but I think it will. And whether, whether that means that the student body makes some kind of consent or, you know, the, these, um, the athletes and, or the people on protest make some kind of concessions or Tim Wolf does step down. I think the game gets played. I think it's played too. Um, and before, you know, we got to move on. We've been spending a lot of time on this, but um, at BYU underscore SF Giants fan, you know, you can tell who he roots for. Uh, he says, and it's an interesting take here. Renegotiate. Rescheduling is the best option. I I don't know what that, I, I, I don't know I don't, what the possibilities are there, there, but well, look, I mean, there's some precedent for that. If you remember back to 2001, 9-11, BYU rescheduled the Mississippi State game and ended up playing later in the year. In because between of, the last game of the year and the bowl game when you have four weeks off. Right. I mean, thanks thanks for chiming in there, at BYU underscore SF Giants fan. That is a really I, long name. You need to get a new name. I, but I mean, thanks it, for chiming that's, in. That's it's an interesting thought. Terrible, it's not a terrible option. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure BYU, from a perspective of trying to accommodate everybody involved, I'm sure BYU would be open to that. Yeah, and heck, I mean, maybe if, if Arrowhead Stadium is full, then heck, maybe we just have to play at a little Bell Edwards Stadium. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like All that. right, moving on. Um, oh, just so everyone knows, the poll is right now uh, currently 
20% say yes, BYU should let Missouri out of the contract, and 80% say no. So I think the 80% are, are on something, and I think it will be played. So yeah, let's I move think it will be played, yeah. I think tomorrow or Tuesday it will all get ironed out. I really do. Um, You're a lawyer, so you have a little more idea of this kind of stuff. Well, it's not a legal thing. It's just a PR thing. I'm like, this is not good. This is, I mean, the administration, this is, this is, I think has been an effective movement, both by the student body and the football program Look, we're talking to about put it. pressure. We're talking yep, about, we're talking it, about and, it. Yep. and we're in Texas and absolutely. Oregon. And so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The movement has been very successful except for uh, the student Brown who is still hungry. So. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, Missouri, that's enough on Missouri right now. Now let's go back to the past, the distant past of a late, late Friday night game in the Bay area a high school size stadium. High Texas high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Texas, high, Texas, or like Alabama size high school stadium, um, where BYU played the mighty Spartans of San Jose State University, and they, laid an egg. They pulled off their first win in San Jose since 1966. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they've only played like that. once or twice, right? Since then or something? Uh, in San Jose, I don't know. Either way, it's too long. And mm. that, that, you know, I, I I had an interesting – I put this out there on Twitter, and there was quite a, quite a bit of response on it, um, that I think that game was the ugliest game that BYU's played all year. Some people came back and said – Besides hey, Michigan. I mean, come the, on. The, the thing is about Michigan, there, there's, there's a few vital differences between the Michigan and San Jose State, the biggest one being the scoreboard. BYU, one, did score. And scored. <laughs> two, they won. So those yeah. two differences make it completely different. But it's the way they won. It was just – it was uninspired football. And it was just – for some reason, it, it felt like they just I, – I don't even know how to explain it. I really – I don't even know how we can fill five minutes this because I don't even know what to say other than it was just really, really ugly. Well, who do you blame? I, I, I got my answer for this, but who, who do you blame for for that performance? You know, I, I don't know if I have a particular person, but I, I have to say the coaching staff because when you go into a bye week after you just dominated an opponent, so you really had like two like and a half three weeks three off, weeks basically, yeah, to to prepare for this game, and you go against a defense that obviously their pass defense wasn't as good as their ranking showed. Their run defense was awful, but BYU made them look like it was completely opposite. There, their run defense was better. I, I think the coaches didn't prepare them. I really, really don't. I don't think there's. I, I think it, it. It's hard to put it. On, you can put it on the players, but no, I didn't see life in the players. Well, and I think I, disagree, I think the them. first quarter they're actually really good. I mean, they scored fourteen really quick points. They went up fourteen and three. They went up fourteen to three. What really changed it was the pick six at the end of the second half. And suddenly you're like, they're about to go up twenty-one to three, and you were about to. We were about to feel like, okay, this game's over. Like at the, at the end of the second quarter. Um, and next thing you know, it's a four-point game going in to halftime. And and I think that just it gave San Jose State life. I think at that point, BYU had begun to just kind of let it go, you know, to take the term from the Disney movie. Okay, so then even more so that you put it on the coaches because then there's your momentum. Sure. Swing. And then at halftime, you come out and you only score three points in the second half. Like, well, I, I I'll blame it on two. I'll blame it on two things. I mean, I I'm, I can't really argue too much against the coaching, except that I do think they came out of the gates pretty well. Um, and the defense played really, really well. Only gave up ten points. Um, but. There, there's two groups that I really blame the most. One was the offensive line, but that was mainly because they had four starters out, including Tejan Karoma, which is humongous. There was actually, and if you watch, a lot of the snaps were high, and yeah. and and Tanner was really kind of doing this a lot with the snaps, um, and also the run blocking was terrible. Um, so I really put on the offensive line, but I don't say that derisively. I just, as a matter of fact, it's, it was backups. And they just didn't play very well. And the, the second person that I really blame the most is uh, Tyler Mangum. Um, <laughs> Tyler Tyler had a terrible game. <laughs> and for those of you who watched the game live or didn't watch it on TV or, or only listen to our podcast and don't actually watch games, um, the, the, these terrible CBS sports announcers kept calling Tanner Mangum Tyler Mangum and kept calling Johnny Linehan Jerry Linehan. I'm sure like three or four times. Oh, more than that. It was awful. Yeah. Uh, and so this, this, of course, led to uh, my favorite tweet of perhaps the year where Tanner Mangum says after the game, 
we got the win exclamation point can't complain with a w exclamation point but i'll tell that tyler mangum guy to not throw any more pick sixes hashtag go cukes <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's my pretty favorite. pathetic especially oh, okay the punter you could understand mixing up the punter because <laughs> right, this guy's a national good. phenomenon yeah I, it, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty bad um i i agree with you though there's the offensive line um but again when when you when you know a couple of those guys have been out for a couple of weeks you go into this game probably knowing that they're not going to play or have limited reps so these guys are getting practice reps and you're going against an awful run defense and you get 36 yards? Like, what? Yeah, yeah. no, that was, In my opinion, when you, when you have that kind of time to prepare for them and you only get that kind of output, that goes to some form of a coaching lapse. Or truly, it could be there's a reason these guys are second string and they're just not that good. It could be that, too. I I think the running game was because of the offensive line. I, I don't really blame much much else on it. Um, but so you anybody know, involved in the offensive line, which is two J and those five guys up front. Sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just think they just didn't have much much experience and they weren't ready, especially for the run block. I mean, Tanner had plenty of time to throw. Tanner actually had a pretty good, pretty good game when it was at uh, Tanner with twenty three for thirty seven, which is sixty two percent, two hundred ninety three yards, a touchdown, touchdown, and an interception. Um, yeah, yeah, that's. That's a respectable game. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously the interception turned into points, but overall that stat line isn't bad. Um, it's, it, it was really the reason BYU couldn't put 20 plus points is because they had 36 yards on the ground. I also think that they went away from the run game really early. I thought they were throwing more than I thought they were going to, but yeah, I, I, I don't think they went away from it. I, I thought that was planned all along. I mean, to me, I think they looked at the San Jose and this might be a, a coaching you know, blunder, but I, I think it looked very clearly like this game was another game to, to develop. And since so many of the running backs were hurt, um, they thought that they would give Tanner a bunch of throws. And I, I, I thought that from the beginning. I don't think they were going away from the run game. I thought that was just the game plan, almost treating it like another Wagner. Like we need to go out there, get sharp. They looked sharp against Wagner. Wagner was terrible, but they looked sharp. Right. Uh, against San Jose State, they looked sharp for about a quarter and a half and then couldn't move the ball. See, I, I never I never felt, even though Tanner's line is pretty good, I never felt he looked sharp. Two throws in particular, in my opinion, were what defined Tanner's not being sharp. Ironically, the touchdown pass was actually a foot and a half behind Mitch Matthews, and he get, went back. That was a great catch. Made a great catch on a not good throw by uh, Tanner Mangum. On a slant, it was a terrible throw. That's, yeah, on a slant, a very yeah. routine throw. Second yeah. one was the yet again botched opportunity to get Devon Blackman in the end <laughs> when Tanner Mangum just threw it at his feet. Yeah. He was being rushed a little bit, but Tanner Mangum's good enough to make that throw. And I mean, he's been rushed plenty of times, thrown off his back foot and thrown a better ball than that. So those two throws in general were, I think, really epitomized what I felt to be Tanner Mangum tonight. Like he was hitting the guys just because the defense was giving him that much room. Yeah. But if you were playing anybody other than San Jose State who was giving you 10 yards, those passes would have either been A, intercepted, or deflected. And it, I just didn't feel like Tanner Mangum was sharp. He would just look sharp because he wasn't going against a very good defense. Uh, moving back to Twitter, I, um, we asked, who do you blame for BYU's terrible performance at San Jose State? At Y for number four, life, L-Y-F-E. These Twitter names, man, just – Keep it simple, guys. It's life with the Y. It's, it's given tribute to. Ryan. I get it. Double Y. Okay. At Y for life. Um, he says, "I'm just confused how we came out of Cincy game healthy, and then half, and then half the team suddenly got injured over two bye weeks. And if they knew of the injuries, did they really use bye weeks to prepare? Find out Tuesday, I guess. That's. I think that's a fair, a uh, fair point. I mean, Cincy seemed like they were pretty full strength. Going to Wagner, pretty full strength, and now suddenly, you know, the offensive well, no, line no, is obliterated. Honest, their offensive line in the last about three, two, three games has not been full strength. Uwe Lapua, who got hurt on the fake punt, um, you know, a couple a couple weeks ago. Riker Matthews or Kyle Johnson has been hurt for a couple weeks, so their offensive line in particular has been patchwork, but not. The, and then Tijon Karoma was. We didn't find out until day of that he wasn't going, so I don't think they were. Uh, as healthy as he's making it out to be. But again, either way, you had a glorified three weeks to get ready for this game. 
and, and you weren't ready for it. And if this was if this was Missouri at full strength, I think it would, you could say, okay, they just played a team that was good enough to play BYU to that. I don't think San Jose State is that good. This was just yeah. San Jose State's and more or less their bowl game, that this is the best team they've played this far, and they're going to play the rest of the season. They played their best game, and to their credit, yeah. they did. They yeah. played better. They played that. But BYU, I thought, played down to their level, and that was the difference. I agree. I was really happy with the defense. I, I really do feel like the defense has improved each week this year, and as they get healthy, I feel like this defense is really – has all it was really good. I mean, I feel like the defensive and we've talked about it a lot, so I won't go into too much, you know, depth, but I feel like the defensive backs have all stepped up and, and have been able to play their coverage, both man and zone, a lot better. Um, Harvey Longy, I think, is finally turning into the inside linebacker we thought he would. And the defensive line, I think, is as good as it's been since Ziggy. I really do. So um Warner had a fantastic, fantastic game. Yeah. Defensive player. Oh, Fred Warner. Yeah, no. He and I tweeted out, you know, during the uh, during the game, he was flying all over, but staying in his assignments. That's what I love the most. I saw him several times rushing the edge, um, full speed. But then as soon as he saw like an outside jet sweep or something um, developing, slow down, stop, and and move laterally, right, and seal the edge like he's supposed to do as he's coming around the edge, rather than just kind of going full steam to where he thinks the ball's going, and then have it go the other way or have yeah. the option. Or whatever. Warner so. had a had had his signature game as a Cougar, in my opinion. He had a couple sacks or sack recovery. Half. He had some tackles for loss. He was he was gap sound. He he was fast. He was good in coverage as well. He's one of their better cover linebackers. Yeah, he's um, tall. He, he had a great great game. It was fun to watch. He, he this is what we, you and I have talked a lot about through the season is his ability and he he's looked great. He has looked great and it makes me really excited. His brother's being is one of the new. Uh, early signees that gets to come on campus in January. And uh, I mean, you, oh gosh, Troy Warner with that extra time to be with the squad, uh, he could start next year. He really could. Wadsworth, I think is a senior, right? So yeah. when you talk about that other safety back there, when I think about Kai Nakua and Troy Warner at safety, like my heart stops. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. All right, before we finish up, Hoops has started, and the BYU basketball team has taken on the huge programs of Arizona Christian University and Alaska Fairbanks. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, your, two, your two name programs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I didn't watch the Arizona Christie game, but I was able to watch the um, Alaska Fairbanks game. And one thing that I got out of it is BYU has got a lot of guys that can shoot. The rock. They got, yeah, they got depth. One, not only that can shoot it, but one that want to shoot it. They get any <laughs> from anywhere, and that ball is going up. Yeah. Hartsock, Calvert, Emery, uh, obviously Toolson. Fisher, Toolson. Fisher, yeah, it, it's. I'm mean, that's just to name a few, and then Jordan Chapman didn't even play yesterday. Yeah, so they, they've got a legitimate six or seven guys that can knock it down. The one thing that I'm nervous about is all their injuries down low. They were it was getting really hyped up about the ability to play inside out, and depending on the injuries and the severity of them, it's looking like we might have a lot more of those threes going up than we were expecting at least early on in the season. Yeah, so, because Davis and Ace both are out with ankle things. It sounds like it's not serious, but um, Kafusi's you know, got a hamstring. So. And Kafusi's hamstring. I mean the. Play that kind of depth and that kind of um, balance will go a long way. At the very least, Kyle Davis, I think he averaged like a block and a half um, as in his 27 games or whatever it was that he started at Utah State. Um, and then, of course, uh, Kafusi is, is, is a really, really good defensive presence. So at the very least, even if these bigs can't produce a ton of offense, although I do think Kyle Davis will and Jamal Aids perhaps, I haven't seen him much. Um, if they if they can just stay pr productive on the defensive end, alter shots, get a couple blocks, and eat up the rebounds, that will go – that will do leaps and bounds for this program. I, I really think so because defense is what they need. They got offense, and we saw them. We saw them in the boom shakalaka, and we saw them in – in the first two um, exhibition games, these guys can shoot. They can get to the rack okay. They're going to put up points, but they need to be able to get stops, and I think big guys down low will help a lot with that. 
I, I think so too. But one thing I saw last night, and again, it was against you no know, Alaska Fairbanks, but I thought BYU's man-to-man defense looked a lot better. There's been a lot of talk about their their commitment to defensive progression this offseason. And I think I've seen it. I think you're going to see BYU do a little more man-to-man than you see. Maybe more of that matchup zone that they kind of run uh, quite frequently. But I think because it seems like they have a lot more depth this year, young depth given, but depth nonetheless in, in true just ability and talent, I think you're going to see BYU able to do a lot more one-on-one guarding because they have that fresh legs and ability to come in. Uh, obviously, you know, it'll take him back, uh, Rose, about 10 games to get his his um, rotation down. But I, I think you're looking at BYU having at least a solid eight, nine man rotation. And when you have that deep of a rotation, you can have fresh legs come in, which allows you to do man to man defense, which BYU hasn't been able to do. And so they get burned when you have guys that are extremely athletic, such as people at Gonzaga and those kind of, you know, or potentially yeah. Oklahoma and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I hate to do this, but uh, there's some breaking news, if you want to call it. I just saw Greg Rubel tweet it, um, and Brent McMurphy is reporting. The headline on ESPN.com 12 minutes ago, Missouri player says many on team don't support practice boycott. Um, Interesting. Yeah, here's the quote from the anonymous player who, for obvious reasons, doesn't want his name in the press. Quote, as much as we want to say everyone is united, half the team and coaches, black and white, are pissed. The player who wishes to remain anonymous told ESPN, quote, if we were 9-0, and this wouldn't be happening. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, gosh, very- they need they to stop to- this. Oh, this administration has got to do something because this is getting ugly quick. That, that, <laughs> getting that, ugly. that. that- that quote alone could could that that could be a real um, cookie crumb that's going to lead to the end of this because if that's if you're not truly united when your coach is saying you are and yep. you have guys coming out and saying and say hey we want to play some football here get your yep. crap in gear that yep. it, you know hopefully that guy is I hate to say this hopefully that guy is African American and not white because if he's white and find out that's a crap storm is going to hit from that that's gonna yeah. Hit. Yeah, yeah. So sorry to interrupt uh, your p- previously scheduled basketball talk, but uh, this Missouri thing is getting out of hand. It's getting ugly. Uh, this administration needs to figure out a way to get this game to happen because if it doesn't, it is going. It, it, this has long term ramifications for this program. Huge, huge for ramifications. Recruiting, the fans, um, a- academics. I mean, like it or not, what happens in athletics spills over to your student body and your admissions rates and your application rates. And it, this is bad for Mizzou. They need to stop this right now. Okay, so, so let me ask you this, because th- this was another part of what the whole Twitter sphere, what's going on. Should this game happen, whether it be with black players, without some, or whatever, however, if it happens in one capacity or another, do you think Missouri comes out flat or comes out inspired? I think they come out inspired. This is now their uh, their Super Bowl. I mean, they're what, three and five or something, four and I five think or something? four and four. Yeah, they're, they're, they do not have a winning record. They, they're not playing for anything. They're playing for bowl eligibility, which is huge. Um, and they're playing for publicity. This is now their movement game, right? Where they can come back and say, look, on two days practice, we're all together. And, you know, I mean, it's a huge thing. Well, really obviously do. they're not. Obviously they're well, not. Well, until 12 be, minutes ago, I'll yeah. I'll <laughs> devil's advocate here in the short time we have left. I think they come out flat because even if it takes, let's say, two days. Let's say it, it, it goes into Tuesday, Wednesday. That's three days of practice this team has lost. Yep. Whether it be half the players not doing it in preparation for BYU or themselves, um, and then now you have somebody coming out and saying the team is not united, that's going to cause conflict in the locker room because now everybody's going to wonder who the heck said that and then who are the players that he's saying that's not with them. I think that causes turmoil in the locker room. I, I'm going to play devil's advocate and think that strictly because of that quote that you just read, I think that makes Missouri come out flat, not inspired, and conflicted within it could the happen, man. And it, it, you know what? It could turn into a real nightmare if the game is played, given that new kind of information. I forgot to mention this, and we got to go. Time's up. But just out of pure, like, the universe hating the University of Missouri right now, <laughs> Missouri was organizing, that's right, a whiteout for this game. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh gosh, it could. It just can't get worse. Oh, they just need to that's, stop that's, this. That's where you just drop the microphone. I know. It's like wait, boom. Wait. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. It's been a wild and crazy week in BYU sports. We're glad you joined us to recap it, predict it, talk about it, analyze it. Um, I'm Andy Karchner. Follow us at Sports Bros on the Twitter machine. We Our online home is tornbysports.com. My personal Twitter is at A Karchner. Aaron, what do you got before we go? Um, I'm online on or on Twitter, actually that Twitter machine at AA14DK again at Sports Bros. We're on it probably more than we should. Um, other than that, it, it's going to be a really interesting week. Everybody's got to be watching the Twitter machine because that's where everybody gets news now, anyways. CNN, Fox, all those—they're pretty much dying because they're all on Twitter. So uh, follow that because you're, this is going to be obviously, as we've seen, a minute by minute update on this BYU Missouri game this weekend. It's it's going to be a pretty tense week for everybody involved, fans included. It is. And, you know, we didn't mention it. This is if the game doesn't go, that could jeopardize BYU's ability to get to 10 wins, which is huge for this program. So, all right, guys, catch us next week, every, every Sunday night at 730 Pacific, 830 Mountain Time. We'll catch you next week. Go Cougs. Tyler Mangum.